Welcome to the Rise of the Super Bean podcast. So today my guest is Todd Fox. Todd is the author of the book Protection for and from Humanity. He has a military training. He is a BJJ third degree black belt. Is the owner of the Tour Protection. Man, you you sound like an actual hero. <laughs> <laughs> Just sounds like it. Not real, but sounds like it. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining me. I've been following your work. I've been listening to lots of your podcasts. I've been reading your book as well. And uh, I even would like to start, Todd, with, um, with one of the quotes of your book, because I found it super interesting. The, the will to survive, it's instinct, instinctual, but the ability to survive, it's learned. <laughs> I found that Absolutely, very, very man. powerful. I, so do I. And uh, that is a mantra I heard as a young man throughout the Marine Corps experience that I had. And I don't think there's any easier expression or way to see that than jujitsu, because you see guys who maybe aren't super tough or maybe aren't super physical, and they learn these techniques, right? And it changes what the possibilities are for them in a fight and in life in general. So a hundred percent, people s seem to think sometimes that you're just born with whatever. And that's not the case, man. Most people work really hard to get where they're at. They learn certain things. They train hard. They learn more things. They never stop learning. And I, I expect it's probably the same with you. Like I'm, I'm 26 years into my jujitsu experience and I'm still learning almost every time that I roll and anytime I go somewhere different, I see a different perspective or a different approach. So I, I, I believe that quote a hundred percent and it, it's, it's absolutely learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's impressive. You know, the, the journey never stops. You know, Jiu Jitsu is such a good metaphor for life, you know, because it's so many things. We're never going to be able to master anything. We're never going to be able to execute all the techniques and it's always a constant learning process. Huh? A hundred percent, man. I agree with you there. And I think that anybody that's done jujitsu for a period of time finds that it's the best analogy for life. Mm, yeah. So Todd, um, so just, just a little bit so, the, uh, you know, the audience can, can know a little bit more um, about your background as well. So w where did you grow up? In? Uh, I grew up in the middle of the States um, in a place called St. Louis. So St. Louis is literally in the center of the United States. And it's what we refer to as, as the Midwest. Mm, that's awesome. And how, did you start your military training first or the martial arts first? Because, man, also you've been training uh, kickboxing, boxing, Mai Tai. Uh, you even done uh, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu as well, right? Yeah, that's all correct. So I started martial arts before I went in the Marines. I went in the Marines young, but I'd started martial arts, you know, 15, 16 years old and more traditional martial arts where I was doing karate. And I had a karate teacher that also kind of integrated jujitsu, not jujitsu, but uh, judo into mm -hmm. it. So we would have takedowns and throws that, that karate doesn't have. Um, so I was lucky to have that. And then I went in the Marines um, right out of high school. Um, I joined at 17. And um, while I was in the Marines, we did what they refer to as combatives, right? They had a program mm -hmm. called linear infighting, neuro override engagement, a long, a long mouthful of words that basically <laughs> meant combatives. Um, so the line training we did, which was punching and kicking and throwing and all of that stuff. And then we did boxing and smokers. They call them smokers. They put you in these basically soft walled rooms and, and you fight guys, basically you head punch them to death. Um, so I had done that. And then um, when I was in the Marine Corps still, I was teaching uh, karate, almost like a, a Kyokushinkai, a bare knuckle style karate with a guy named uh, Martin Fosterling. And then while I was in the Marines, I, I was really super lucky. And I had exposure to Rodrigo Vaghi, who is a Hickson, um, fifth degree black belt. And basically, I, he happened to be right next to where I was working in the Marines, like literally next door. And one of the guys I was working with said, oh, this guy, Rodrigo, he's great. He's a Brazilian guy. He taught at the Gracie Academy in Rio, and he just came here. I want to introduce you to him. So it was pure luck, man, that I found yeah. jiu-jitsu. That's so awesome. So Todd, um, just before we get into your, your story in jiu-jitsu as well, so because you've done Japanese jiu-jitsu, and I kind of forget this question quite a lot, I'm pretty sure some, yeah, you must be the same. So 
what, what, if someone asks you what's the main difference of uh, the Japanese jiu-jitsu and the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, what's your what's your views on that? Well, the Japanese jiu-jitsu that I did was very similar to a guy named Wally J, small circle jiu-jitsu, um, which is Japanese jiu-jitsu. Um, and it focuses a lot on wrist locks and like arm bars, but like bent over straight arm locks. Um, and it's, for me, the techniques are very similar, but it's focused more on small joint manipulation. And it really it would take a lot better positioning. It's a lot less smooth. Uh, it has a lot less control than, than say Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from my perspective. Um, and you're fighting for small things, which is much harder to get than, than a larger joint lock. Um, we had a lot less chokes in, in, uh, you know, small circle style Jiu Jitsu. Um, it, it's my opinion and, and, you know, everybody has a different opinion, but my opinion is that it was not as efficient And I think that what Elio Gracie did, being a small, weak man um, who wasn't healthy, uh, basically took it, modified it, and made it very efficient and very effective using angles and leverage and, and modifying the principles and maybe being a little bit more strict with the principles than the style of Japanese jiu-jitsu that I had initially learned. Mm, that's awesome. So, Todd, what was your motivation to learn so many different martial arts and, and, and why did you stick with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Hmm. So, for me personally, I, I love fitness, I love physicality, I, and I, I probably had a um, higher than normal testosterone level for a young man, <laughs> right? So, I liked fighting. And in the Midwest, where, where I was from, um, you know, we didn't have as many things to do as, as say, a place like real right where you have the beach and the mountains and there's so much going on and, and it's an international community we didn't have that so we had more fighting and guys <laughs> you know not not like you know angry fighting but guys would get in an argument and they would fight and it would be over mm. um, so i was really interested in the fighting component and when i was young i was probably more interested also in um kind of the lifestyle and the traditions and the the formalities and the esoteric components but um what i found in my journey is that a lot of that stuff is smoke and mirrors and it, and it does come back to kind of what you can do in a fight and how you can process stress and how you can apply techniques and what really works. And, and we find, at least I found that with combat sports, and when I say that, I mean, boxing, jujitsu, wrestling, Muay Thai, those things or offshoots of those things. Those are things that when you practice, you do the thing you're going to do in a fight. Whereas if I'm doing katas or if I'm doing something like Tai Chi or if I'm doing something like Aikido, I'm not really getting full resistance. I'm not really getting people trying to punch me in the face. I'm not really getting people trying to choke me unconscious. So I, I find that the, the transfer from a training environment to reality is much easier. It's an easier transition to make. It's a more realistic one. Um, so I always gravitated toward that. So when I found jujitsu, um, I'll give you an idea. You know, when I first went into the school, I was, um, you know, I was a young guy. I was an aggressive guy. I was a tough guy. I had a lot of experience fighting all over the place. And my first experience was just basically getting my ass kicked by a little kid. <laughs> he was like 17 years old and 150 pounds. And he played with me, you know, like a rag doll. I, he, he triangle choked me twice. And, you know, initially I thought it was kind of um, a fluke, something happened, I slipped, I made a mistake, and now I'm going to kick his ass. And, and it didn't, it, it continued. And then from him to the next guy to the next guy. And, you know, that just reaffirms like, that's what I need to be doing. I need to be studying that because if that guy can handle me like that with all the experience and training and, you know, my background and my toughness, that's the thing I need to be doing. And, you know, it's painful to have to face that and say, <laughs> all the stuff I've been doing doesn't work. And now I've got to start again But that's the reality, you know, and that's what separates people too, is you can just put your toe in your legs and walk out and say, well, nobody else can kick my ass, just those guys. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to spend weeks or months just taking an ass beating from these guys. I'm going to learn the material and I'm going to get better at it and I'm going to stop that from happening. And that's, that was kind of the, the path that I chose. That's awesome. That's super cool. And what, what was the, the, the transition, Todd, to, to, put all this, this knowledge and decide to write a book. So what was your motivation? So I've written several books and um, the last book, and let me put, just pull this up because it's good marketing. Yes. This is the current <laughs> book, Protection Foreign from Humanity, right? 
And so basically what it is, is like a field manual on common sense and how to apply certain systems that come from the military and law enforcement um, to daily life for normal people. Um, and so when COVID hit, you know, I had been traveling around the world um, probably 25, 26 years. And in traveling around the world, you learn a lot of things, you see a lot of things. But one of the things is I, I would spend 18 to 20 hours a day working six days a week. And so I had no free time. There was zero free time. And so when COVID hit, they shut down pretty much most of our businesses. So we weren't shooting films on location. We weren't doing music tours around the globe. And that gave me some downtime. And I had been asked, man, I don't know how many times, more than I can count, why don't you put something together for average people so that they can learn these systems and processes? And I had helped a friend um, with a problem that he had at work. And we used these different systems that I taught him and it, and it worked out very well for him. So he had kind of pushed me to do it. And, you know, I had wanted to give something different to people, something different than what we do. You know, I, teaching you how to shoot a gun is one thing. Teaching you how to do jujitsu, that's another thing. Teaching you how to drive a vehicle. All those hard skills are great and they're very useful. But really, everything occurs first in the brain, in the mind. And so it has to be processed. And the, the better solution is never to get to that point where you have to fight, to never get to that point where, you know, you're facing a really nasty situation. And so my focus was on that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to outline the things that I think are critical to teaching average everyday people that I'm going to try to draw some correlation between, you know, these systems in their day to day lives and, and get it out there. So you know, in part, I owe it to COVID because otherwise I wouldn't have this time to do it. And ultimately, with that downtime, I mapped out basically what would be kind of an outline of what I wanted to include in the book. And then I went and wrote each chapter on it and uh, and we got to distribution. So that was, uh, that was you know, uh, beginning of, of last year. So, mm -hmm. and uh, right now, I think we're close to about 7,000 hard copies sold. And Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, the downloads, I think, are uh, a few thousand. So right now we're leading in, in uh, paperback versus uh, ebook, But, you know, that, that just depends on where we're selling it to and, you know, what, what the age group is typically. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So, so Todd, what's the, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure people are curious now, what's the most famous person you, you, you know, you, you had your service, you know, you've been protected. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's I don't know who the most famous is because uh, you know, we deal with like about 35 to 40 clients at any given time. And so probably most well known people that we've worked with would be like Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and those guys. But, mm -hmm. you know, clients that we've had for many, many, many years, um, we do a lot of rock bands and pop bands. So like we've had Tool as a client for 21 years. We've had Nine Inch Nails as a client for quite some time. You know, Roger Waters from Pink Floyd, we've had for a client for many, many years. Um, the Eagles we've had. I mean, it's we've had a lot of clients for, for quite some time. And it, it's a very diverse group of people from, you know, hip hop and, and um, heavy metal to kind of classic rock and, mm. and stuff like that. So I don't know who the most famous is, but um, it just depends on who you talk to and, and where you're at in Brazil. And maybe even in New Zealand, I don't know about Wellington, but like in Auckland, uh, probably Roger Waters from Pink Floyd does the most. Like when we go, we sell out stadiums in, in Rio and in Sao Paulo and Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte. Um, you know, we sell out stadiums everywhere. And then in New Zealand, pretty much Auckland, we would do three or four shows at, at the local stadium there. So I, I would guess those guys, the actors and then a couple of the old school musicians. That's super cool. So Todd, did you ever had a, a star stroke? <laughs> no, you know, I think, I think maybe that's one of the reasons why I can do my job is because uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, um, one, I don't see them as something other than people. They're normal people. Uh -huh. They're not normal, but they're people. Um, and two is they have a very different background than I have. So the way they see things and process things and think about things is very different from me. So, um, you know, with artists, they're very creative and they don't really think in terms of processes and systems and logic and reason. They think about emotion and feeling and, um, you know, they, they think about the immediate term. They don't think about what's down the road in the future and what could happen based on what they do right now. So just the, the approach is very different. 
And, um, you know, that's kind of why it works. They need a guy like me. I need a client like them. And so there's a, a working relationship. And some of the people have a very good working relationship. You know, you work with somebody very closely, like let's say I have a client who I'm on a private jet with every day and it's me and just that client. Mm -hmm. You know them on a very personal level and they tell you things that they wouldn't tell anybody else. But at the end of the day, you know, for me, I'm a very normal, simple, down to earth guy. And I'm dealing with some very complex people who have a lot of money, a lot of power and a lot of issues as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a, a balancing act to work with people at that level. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. Yeah. A lot. I like, uh, I like what you said about the, you know, the, it's more the emotional thing as well. Right? That's super and, cool. and that's a fact. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. They they make decisions in a very different way than I do. I analyze data. I look at that data and I try to predict certain outcomes. And, mm -hmm. you know, in, in jujitsu, we do the same thing. You know, if you react in jujitsu with pure emotion, you're going to lose, mm -hmm. right? If, if you are calm and you're cool and you're looking at it, you say, if I put my hand here, the guy can do this. But if I put it over here, he can't. And I know that if I do this, I can get these three moves and he can only get this one move and you start to analyze and adjust and modify things based on that environment and what you know about that environment and you're looking ahead and you know as a black belt you know we're looking ahead two or three or four or five moves depending on who we're going with mm -hmm. um so that we can predict that future so that we can control the outcome and with artists in particular they don't think that way. And not that's a broad stroke. It's not every artist, but it's most artists, right? And we deal with, you know, actors and musicians, and we deal with some some artists and their mediums like painting and um, things like that. And that's, that's fine. They make beautiful things. And I love what they do. It's just not how I'm wired. And, and they're wired in a very different way. And it lets them be creative. And it lets them see things the way it does. In order to do the protective service operations that I do, you need to be more analytical, and you need to be thinking more about the future and how you know, the actions in present affect the future. Um, to be creative, that doesn't work. And so they couldn't produce what they do if they didn't think that way. And I couldn't produce what I do if I didn't think the way I do. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So yeah, Todd, so that's that's linked to the, my next question as well. You know, the, the what's your views of the, the BJJ and protective security, you know, the similarities? There are a ton of similarities between protective security and BJJ, right? Um, when we talk to people about protection, I don't mean clients and I don't mean military or law enforcement, I mean normal people. We tell them simple stuff, right? We have a, a program and, and your, your viewers uh, and listeners can go to my website, toddafox.com or tourprotection.com and download a PDF. And what that PDF has is the five A's of survival. Mm. Right? And the first one is awareness right and avoidance comes after that so awareness and avoidance are two critical components of jujitsu i don't put myself in a bad position right because in, in order to get caught normally you have to make two or three mistakes it's not just one mistake normally you're in a bad spot you're aligned wrong you stuck something out you didn't defend you didn't have posture whatever it is and so first thing is you have to be aware that that position that submission that problem can occur so we say, you know, don't go where problems occur, right? And so, you know, in your neighborhood uh, or your region, what areas typically have problems, where people get into fights a lot, where people get shot or stabbed. It, it could be a low income area. It could just be a high crime area. I don't know. But, you know, the point is you don't go to those spots if you don't want to get into a fight, if you don't want to get shot, if you don't want to get stabbed. And you also know certain things like, those problems tend to occur after 10 o'clock at night, let's say between 10 o'clock at night and four o'clock in the morning. So if you have to go to those spots, if you must, then you go at eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, and you don't have that same problem. And jujitsu is the same, right? I know that if I do something like straighten my arm, I can only do it for a short period of time before you see it, you recognize it, which is a moment of recognition. And what is followed by the moment of recognition is a moment of action where you move your body to do the thing to me. And so security is the same way. You try to control the exposures. I don't want to be exposed for long periods of time in bad positions. But if I need to get from point A to point B, sometimes I have to go through those bad positions. I make a transition, right? Uh, and that happens a lot in security. I need to go, say, from the airport to a hotel. And when I'm taking that drive from the airport to the hotel, I have to go through a bad area. 
Well, what do we do when we go through a bad area? Well, we make sure our windows up, our doors are locked, we're moving very fast. We don't stop. If a car bumps us, we don't stop. And, and we move quick. And another thing that we do is we shift our attention. We increase our attention when we're going through the bad spot. It's the opposite of when you're at home, when you're sleeping, when you're relaxed or in the shower and you decrease your level of awareness because you're in a safe environment. I'm in this house and I have doors locked and the neighborhood's safe and I have all these things in place. So jujitsu is the same. When I'm transitioning to bad spots, I have to increase my awareness. I know when I get to this position and I'm transitioning from point A to point B, I have to be very aware of where that guy's hips are, his shoulders at, or his hands are at, or his, where his head's at. So very simple there. Um, another thing that we talk about in security is creating angles, right? So if I'm in a, a room, for example, and I'm, I'm looking at windows and doors and where I'm positioned and what barriers in front of me, how am I gonna escape from an attack? This is the same in jiu-jitsu, creating angles, whether you're defending or attacking, because in jiu-jitsu attacking, you need to create angles, right? You think about if I'm in the guard and I grab your cross sleeve, it's gonna be very easy for me to take your back. And this is the kind of thinking that we have in security. Where do I position myself so that if something goes wrong, I can get out, or I can use something as a shield or a tool to stop bullets or knives or to, to keep people far away from me or to delay you know, them from getting to me. Um, very, very similar there. And then from there, we talk about avenues, avenues of, of, of escape typically. And then we get into a thing called aggression. And, and the aggression phase is the same with jujitsu because when you get to a high level, you have to be technical, but technical alone is not going to work. You also need to be very aggressive. And so jujitsu, just like security, you have a lot of time where you're moving slow. It's like a jog, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're setting everything up. You're organizing it the way you need to be. You're trying to get the guy to move the way that you need him to move. And then when you have the window of opportunity, that very small window of opportunity, then you explode and you're very aggressive in that window. And that's really important. And we talk about that more in security with respect to people being attacked or abducted People a lot of times think if they just give up, oh, I just give them what they want. I just go with them. I just do what they say. Then they'll let me go. And it doesn't always work out that way. You know, if they want, if they want my wallet or they want my phone, no problem. I can replace that. That's not an issue for me. But if somebody's telling me to get into a car, um, that's not normally something that works out very well. I want to be aggressive. I want to be able to fight back. I want to be able to deal with it. And it's the same with jujitsu. When you get into certain positions, you certain bad positions in particular, where you really need that aggression or that fight, that mental component to translate physically. So um, another thing that I think is very similar to jujitsu from protective security is space control. So generally speaking, when you're doing jujitsu, uh, when you are taking space or consuming space, you are the attacker. You're the one attacking something, right? I'm taking the space around your neck. I get a choke. I'm taking the space around your arm. I get an arm lock. around your neck and your arm. I'm getting a triangle. When I'm defending, just like you put that choke on me, my goal is to create space. And that's normally true in security as well. When I'm dealing with a problem, my goal is to put space between the attacker and the principal. So I want to create that space because the more space I create, the higher the probability of survival is from mm -hmm. that particular attack. However, if now I've got to fight back, I typically close space, right? So when I, when I counter assault, I don't evacuate. Evacuating is really what we want to do, but if we can't and we're forced to fight back, then we counter assault, I'm probably gonna start closing space because I'm gonna become an aggressor as well. So those similarities for me are very, very close. Also, just getting back to what is probably true for most things, jujitsu is about the basics. If your fundamentals are very good, your jujitsu is probably very good, right? It doesn't need to be complex. If you have two or three solutions to every problem from every position and you're very good at it, you don't need 10,000 movements. And also as you get older, you find that you're not gonna be as physical. You're not gonna be as explosive. You're not gonna be able to move as fast. Maybe your oxygen capacity be, be you know, because of age, it begins to lower. Your testosterone starting, starting around 30-ish years old starts to drop off. And so your game's gonna be different. But if you are really good at the fundamentals, the foundational components, you understand those things, you're good. You're still the good. Fundamentals, now, not the fundamentals, always. Fundamentals. 
Mm. Fundamentals. And that's protection too. Protection comes down to the fundamentals. You talk about protection in terms of don't go where there are problems. If you have to go where there are problems, leave when they start to happen. Don't wait for it to get worse. And that's true in jujitsu too. You start to get into a bad spot, you really want to disconnect or stand up or create posture or uh, remove the grip. Um, those are all very similar things. And the last thing you do is stay and fight in a bad situation. You want to disconnect. If you have to, then we start talking about fighting back to create space so that the principal can get away while you counter assault. So very, very similar things for me um, in terms of how you train, how you focus on fundamentals, how you do a lot of reps of all of the key movements, how it creates um, confidence, how it creates opportunities for you. I mean, I, I see a ton of correlations between jujitsu and, and protective security. That's so awesome, Todd. So Todd, just to, to give us some, so I'm just going to review the, the, the five A's. No? So you, you talk about uh, awareness, avoidance, the angles, avenues, and the aggression, right? And, uh, and I love what exactly you said right. as well. The, you know, so the first point is to avoid, the second is to live, and the third is stay and fight. That's super cool. Yes. And, 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 you know, it seems really oversimplified. Everybody's like, this is common sense. Mm. But people really don't use common sense. We call it common sense because it makes sense and it's very simple and it's logical. And you can see that that's the smart thing to do. But the reality is that people will, you know, go to a place, let's say I go to the worst neighborhood. And I don't know in this moment kind of, you know, what the place is because it tends to shift at different times. But do you know Rio at all? Yes. Yeah. Do you know Rio? Okay. So, so, uh, you know, it used to be like Complexo de Alemão was a really bad Complexo, neighborhood. Yes. And now the last time I was there, they had problems in Mare. Mare was becoming very, very bad. So I don't go as this guy from America who is going to be perceived because I'm white and I'm very clearly not Brazilian. They're going to say, this guy's rich. He's a potential target. And it doesn't matter why I'm a target, whether the person doesn't have something they need to do. It, that, that's irrelevant. I just don't go because I know problems occur there frequently. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't put myself there. If I have to go, like we talked about, I try to go with a local, right? So I grab a local, a friend of mine from Rio, and we go, he speaks the language, he looks Brazilian, he knows the neighborhood. What he really knows is what's normal. And we talk about this a lot in terms of baseline. I establish what the baseline of normalcy is for the reason that I need to be able to establish what an anomaly is. I need to understand when something abnormal occurs, some deviation from normalcy. And the local guy knows that in a way I won't know it. And I've been to Brazil maybe 30 times, 40 times. Wow. I still won't see the small details that the local guy will see. So if I have to go to Mare, what I do is I go with my friend. And when I go, I go on a day of the week that's not as problematic. So let's say it's a Tuesday instead of a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday. And let's say I go at seven in the morning or eight in the morning or nine in the morning. So now I've got the support of a local. He sees when things are normal or not normal. And you know, if something happens that shouldn't be happening at that time of day and that day of week in that area, it starts to unfold. You know what he's going to say to me? He's going to say, hey, man, something's not right. Let's get out of here. Let's go. It's not right. And mm -hmm. so I have that way, like a measuring stick or a gauge. And, you know, in, in America, and I can't speak to New Zealand or how they do it in Brazil, but in America, we have a big problem right now. When something starts to happen that is unusual, this is what people do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> immediately pull out their yeah, phones it's, it's, and they start recording. Yeah. They don't, number one is they don't leave the environment, which is the first thing that I would advocate. You know, something's going wrong, leave. But if you want to stay, if that's your choice to stay, instead of recording, how about help a person, right? We see that with robberies and people getting killed and hurt all the time where they sit there and they record it. So they stay in the environment, but they don't help the person that's being attacked. So you know, the first thing for us, don't go where the problems are. Second thing is leave when they start to happen. And then the last thing is, um, just like jujitsu, we try to figure out how to best handle the problem that we have, right? It can be two or three guys that don't have any weapons. It can be one guy with a gun. It could be somebody with a knife or a bat or anything. 
And how do we handle that? Where do our friends or family go? Like, where do I put my wife or my kids or where do I put my grandma or whoever I have with me? And how do I best address it if I can't leave? Can I create space between us? You know, where's their weakness? And, and all of that stuff really in terms of options needs to be done in advance. You know, you can learn jujitsu in one lesson, right? You got to keep coming over many, <laughs> many years. Same with firearms, same with driving, same with tactics, same with, with, with problem solving, right? And jujitsu, mm -hmm. just like security, is problem analysis solution. And that's how we come to be successful because we train through all the potential outcomes and we have solutions for them. That's awesome. Preparation, always the, the key. A hundred percent. 100% preparation. You know, that's what you're doing in jiu-jitsu, right? Mm -hmm. Why are you drilling that move so many times? Why are you letting that guy give you resistance? You have the the drilling component and then you have the sparring component because you need to add reality to that jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So, yeah, so you, you mentioned, so before, Todd, you mentioned, um, you know, going to the evolution of jiu-jitsu. I'd like to talk about that. But just before you mentioned, you, you've been in New Zealand and you know Steve Oliver, right? <laughs> Yeah, Steve Oliver is a friend of mine from 20 plus years ago. So back uh. in the day, um, I lived, Henry Aikens and I lived in LA in an apartment and we trained at Hickson's. And so Steve would come from Auckland to LA to train with us twice a year. And he used to sleep on the couch and eat all our food. And I don't know, if for <laughs> yeah. people that don't know who Steve Oliver is, Steve Oliver's a massive human. Steve, yeah. you know, he was... <laughs> he was like 250 pounds, but he was like 5% body fat. Yeah, um, yeah. And, That's a and, and I'm sure you probably, probably know the story. Like Steve's dad was one of the best athletes to ever come out of New Zealand. Yeah. And, you know, Steve had a gym that he started. He was a, a big weight lifter and power lifter and all that kind of stuff. But he also did jujitsu and did Muay Thai. And he was training um, for grappling Mark Hunt now there. So Mark Hunt was fighting in K1 and pride and all that kind of stuff. And, and so Steve was very connected to that realm, but then he would come to train with us to learn the jujitsu technique. And so I've kept in touch with Steve for 20 something years. So every time I'm in Auckland, which is usually twice a year, I connect with Steve I go to his school we train together we go out and grab a coffee or whatever else so Steve's Steve's great man I'm, I'm glad you know him ah uh, that's awesome please man the next time you in, in New Zealand you you must come to Wellington I'm gonna bring you here to do a seminar for us it's gonna be awesome it's a beautiful place man I would love to be I mean right now with the lockdown and all that's hard um Steve has asked me to come teach a protection seminar mm -hmm. in Auckland so we've talked about that so that would be the best time for me to come down and see you mm -hmm. in Wellington I uh, mean New Zealand is one of my I've been to 148 countries and I would definitely say top five is New Zealand in my top five Ah, really? Well, in any specific uh, reason, Todd? Why is that? Yeah. So, so one is the North Island and the South Island are very different, right? I don't mean in terms of the people or the food, but I'm talking about the landscape, and it's crazy beautiful in both places. Mm -hmm. You know, you have. Uh, things like Piha Beach, you got these black sand beaches and these just gorgeous places. And then you go further south and you get into, you know, these crazy jagged mountains that are snow covered. And, you know, the people are very different. Um, you know, we speak the same language and we have a lot of the same uh, cultural attributes, but they're they're almost a little bit more cool, a little bit more relaxed, um, you know, but then yeah. when things heat up, they're ready to jump in and into the fire and deal with it. And that's a cool kind of mix for me to have. So when you have this beautiful landscape, these people who are very cool, but also they're not afraid to fight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can go snow skiing and I can go surfing in the same day. Um, and also what I've found in New Zealand is you have a ton of people coming from other communities like you. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool mix. Uh, and, and it kind of blends into the same mindset and ideas. And um, I really, really enjoy all of my visits there, I've never had a bad visit to New Zealand. And that's certainly not true with most countries. Mm -hmm. We tend to have problems and, and that's part of my <laughs> job too. But in New Zealand, man, great time. And there, you know, um, there are some places, uh, do you know the um, Gibbs Farm? Have you ever heard of that? No. So imagine this massive, and I don't know if you know the difference between hectares or acres, but imagine like thousands of acres and having this art installation, um, this wealthy family created, and it's, it's on the water. Uh, it's got a ton of art. It's a ton of animals. They have like giraffes and rhinos and all kinds of crazy animals there, mm -hmm. but they'll have that. And then you'll have this 
big city where there's this corporate business. And then you have, you know, another component where um, you can go somewhere and not see people for days on end. So, you know, that's, that's a super, super cool thing for me to have access to when I travel. I, New Zealand, again, top, definitely top five. Ah, that's so awesome. Yeah, I'm biased because holy, I've been living now for 12 years here. Yeah. <laughs> and I Man, love I tell you, I tell somewhere. you this. I, I almost on the opposite end of the spectrum from New Zealand. I don't know. Maybe Brazil for me might be top 10, not top five, but top 10. Mm -hmm. Because for kind of different reasons, because there's definitely a passion in the Brazilian people that doesn't exist in New Zealand and other places, certainly not in America. And that's cool. With that passion comes some problems too, as you know. <laughs> um, but but it's it's a very different vibe. So I can appreciate, you know, very different cultures. And, and some of the things that I like are in stark contrast, just because it's very different than what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. So Todd, you just mentioned, um, you know, problems, you know, I think people are very, you must get this question quite a lot as well. No, did, do you have any story when you know things went very wrong and you have to use all your skills in a real life situation? Yeah, most of the problems that I've had have occurred in Latin America, including Brazil. Mm. Uh, so we've had probably more problems in Mexico and Colombia than Brazil. Um, but even the last few times I've been in Brazil, I've had some issues because let's say, for example, I have a security team and they come from Bope, Core, they come from Jota, and um, you know, they are 100% Bolsonaro, 100%. Yeah. And then I have a client who is an artist, and they're going to see Lula's friends and do that. And so that creates some problems for me internally and with other people. And even, you know, um, I've had some issues where they become very violent physically. Guns come out and people are threatening to kill people. Very nasty. We've had some kidnap attempts in South America. Um, but uh, the, the bigger issue more is, is dealing with the cultural differences. Um, when we deal with South America, because we spent so much time there, we have good relationships there, we find a way to navigate it. Places that are a little bit harder are like Africa and the Middle East, where we have challenges. And... You know, I can't discuss anything that happens with governmental bodies. I can't discuss the executive components, but I can discuss anything that our clients talk about. And, you know, we've, we've had issues in Eastern Europe as well, where, you know, Eastern European gangsters set up, say, a concert with somebody and then they don't like the concert. So they demand the money back and then guns come out and you're surrounded by 12 AK-47s and they're demanding $50,000 in cash at four o'clock in the morning on a Sunday night. Um, and, and, you know, we, we figure out ways through advanced planning to navigate that stuff. And part of it is being lucky, you know, being lucky that they don't know what you know, and you have some, some uh, magic that you can kind of pull out of your pocket. Wow. That's so interesting. And that's super, super cool. So Todd, let's talk, uh, man, you've been so fortunate as well to train with so many well-known Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu you know, people all over the place, right? From Hickson. Very Hickson. lucky, man. I, I don't know anybody that's luckier than me. Yeah. <laughs> that's so yeah, awesome. So, so I was I was just lucky to meet Rodrigo Vaghi, and then he happened to be a black belt under Hickson. And then when I had to move in the Marines to LA, he immediately connected me you know, to, to Hickson is like, nope, you're training at Hickson's. So, you know, it's a, it's a big deal, man. And, and I don't um, underestimate what I've had access to. I really understand the gifts that I've been given. So, you know, um, Hickson, Rodrigo, Henry, all those guys. And, you know, then getting to train with guys like Henzo and Henzo has been a huge inspiration to me and not even as much jujitsu, even though I love his jujitsu as a person, like the things that he's done for me, I'm not on his team, um, and yet he takes care of me as if I'm his family. Um, you know, there are a lot of different places that I've gone and trained and they're not like that. And then Henzo, you know, the level that he's at and not just being good at, at MMA and jujitsu and fighting, but um, having the fame and recognition that he has and still treating me as if I'm his equal, you know. Uh, and you can go to other places where it's the opposite of that. And they want you to bow down to them and kiss their ass. And mm. it's... it's uh, 
I'm just, I'm lucky. Like you said, you, you, you use the perfect word luck to meet the right people at the right time. Um, and then be able to travel to those places where I'm going to have more access to them. So uh, mm -hmm. agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so Todd, what's, what's your, not being a Jiu Jitsu pra practitioner for, you know, 26 years plus, um, what, how, how do you see this evolution of the sport? And are you happy with this evolution as well? Are you happy with, with what you're, you're seeing in the, the Jiu Jitsu community? Yeah, I, I, I have mixed feelings is the truth. And so mm -hmm. one thing is that I'm very happy that Jiu Jitsu is blown up, that it's everywhere, right? And even if it's not the best Jiu Jitsu, it's still probably better than not having Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And so I used to travel back in the day around the world and it was very, very hard to find somewhere to train Jiu Jitsu. So if you weren't in, um, let's say, um, uh, Brazil, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York. Like if you weren't in a place like that, you weren't training jujitsu for the most part. And this is 25 years ago. Now there's no city that I go to that doesn't have jujitsu everywhere I go is jujitsu. So I'm very happy about the growth and development of jujitsu. Um, I, I do appreciate and understand why Carlinos has needed to make it a very systematic sport. If you remember back in the day, you know, we would have referees who are waving to people in the stand and not paying attention to what's going on. Yeah. Maybe they don't even know the, the point system. And, yeah. and, you know, and, and I don't know, you don't, you probably didn't have this experience, but I've had it a lot where, you know, if you're an American going against a Brazilian, the referee is Brazilian, you need to submit that guy. You yeah, have to submit yeah, yeah. the guy to win. It's not like that anymore. It's not like that anymore. So it's it's changed mm -hmm. for the better, and I and I appreciate that. Um, so a lot of good changes there. A lot of structuring. A lot more tournaments. A lot more exposure. Um, you know, a, a lot of different games and ideas have been added to the mix, and I think that's a good thing. I'll say though that I'm not a fan of tournament style jujitsu. Now I did for many years tournament jujitsu, and in you know the last two months I've done four tournaments. Um, so yeah, I and, and just it. just for the audiences, well, you you're you know you just won the 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 national the American national, so you're the champion of the. So you you're a middleweight, right? So you what 85, 80, 85 kg? Yeah. So um yeah. So we. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's 83 kilos, whatever it is. So it's in in, in mm. pounds. It's um, you know, it's with with the gi on. So you have to step on with the gi and the belt and whatever else. It's 181. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly kilo wise, but like 83 or so kilos. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I do that because it's a challenge for me and my intention in competing in tournament jujitsu is not because I like tournament jujitsu. My intention is to put myself at risk to expose myself to people that are, you know, m at my level and not be telling people that I can do stuff and I'm this and I'm that. My intention is to see, to check, to put myself on the line and potentially lose. And I will learn in losing and that's great, but I need to more than anything, just have the experience. So I need to feel the anxiety. I need to, you know, have the pressure on me to perform. And then I need to apply the things I've been training under a, a high degree of stress. It's not a guy in my gym. It's my friend. It's a guy that's trying to break me off from another gym who's a rival gym at this big tournament. He wants this title. So that's really my personal reasons for doing it. But, you know, I don't care for what I'm seeing with regard to point style jujitsu. This is my opinion. And, you know, jujitsu changes with the length of your limbs. Jiu-Jitsu changes with the thickness of your limbs. Jiu-Jitsu changes with your mindset. So you're an aggressive person, you do it one way. You're a passive person, you do it another. And some things will fit. And then on top of that, you have your background. So if you were a judoka, you may like one style of jujitsu. If you were a wrestler in particular here, if you're an NCAA All-American wrestler, you're going to gravitate toward a different style. And so I appreciate the different styles, but for me, I really want to stay inside a basic, strong, fundamental style that applies gi, no gi, MMA, street fighting, and fighting with guns and knives and everything else. And in the current style trends that I'm seeing with inverted guard and Baron Bolo and all these other things is not in alignment with what I'm doing. I don't want to do that. It doesn't mean that I think someone else shouldn't do it. If that's what they love, that's great. 
I would let them strap a gun on and, you know, have a, a type of kit and be in the dirt and rocks and trying to move around with somebody 150 pounds bigger and apply those same techniques. I don't believe that works. Um, the only way that I know it doesn't work is by testing it over and over and over again. And so for my job and what I do, we need to train on the rocks. We need to train in the sand. We need to train in the backseat of a car. We need to train under a car. We need to train where we're bent back over the hood of a vehicle. And that's how you test it and know it works. And then I take the same techniques and I put a gi on and I go and do it to another black belt. And it does or doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, I try it again with some other people. And if it doesn't work consistently, I throw it away. If it works consistently in all those realms, I keep it. That's so awesome. So Todd, based, based on what you're saying, um, if, if a beginner, if someone is listening to, to, to us right now and um, it's interesting, you know, came to try jiu-jitsu. So based on what you're saying for real life situations, um, it's the guard should be the first, uh, the first way to learn how to play guard. I think that's, I think that depends a lot on who it is because let's, let's, let's go back to the wrestler. I don't agree that the wrestler should learn to play guard because he's probably going to get the takedown. He's probably going to end up on top, right? More often than not, almost always. So that's something that's very important. Um, also, how you're fighting and what you're used to. Let's say it's a judoka. He's probably not going to play guard. He needs to learn guard. But for me, for example, because I was a small guy in my gym and I had a bunch of big guys, I was always going to end up the on guard. the ground in the guard. <laughs> so I had to develop it. Another thing, I'll give you an example. You know, my perspective, um, I used to love to do arm bars. I still love arm bars, but I never use them anymore in the street because when you deal with people who are on certain drugs or have certain mental illnesses or whatever it may be, you breaking their arm is not going to stop the fight. Yeah. And so I focus on chokes. That's 90% of my game is, is choking because that's what works under pressure against people who are trying to really hurt you. Mm -hmm. um, so those little modifications can be made. But I, I agree that if you're a smaller person, if you're a woman, 100%, you need to learn guard. That's where I would say, you know, there's a certain kind of size and history that I would say, Starting point is the guard for you. You got to start somewhere and that's going to be your point. But a big part of that too is what's their goal? Or is it self-defense? Is it tournament jujitsu? Is it physical fitness? Mm -hmm. um, and everybody comes to the, the, the art of jujitsu for something different. In my case, when you talk to me, everything I think about is a fight. I don't think about it in terms of points. I don't think about it in terms of fitness. I'm thinking about it as a fight. And I have friends who are really good jujitsu guys. And every time they're rolling, they're only thinking about points. How many points am I getting? How many am I points up on this? Would I get an advantage? I don't think that way. Um, I'm hmm. not telling you how you should think or anybody else should think, but you know, it really depends on your mindset. So I would say um, I agree with you for people like under 180 pounds, you know, people that are not wrestlers or judoka in particular, mm -hmm. you're going to end up on, on the ground and you really need to learn how to work that guard. If you're a very large person who's, you know, 150 kilos, you're probably not going to be a guard player. I, you know, you could be, but you'd be an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. So true. So Todd, what's, what's your opinion? So how, how can we bridge this, this gap between the competition and, you know, versus reality? I don't know. I, I, I don't know that, that we need to. I mean, I think we need to let things kind of evolve the way people want it, right? People are directing it based on what they want, what outcome they're looking for, the things they like. What I do, and I, I don't want to bridge or, or modify anything. What I do is I train the way that works for me and I, I test that, right? So, you know, like we talked about me going out and training against cars and inside of cars and in the dirt and in the grass and whatever else. So I would advocate that people train to ensure the results that they want by training in a realistic manner specific to their goals. And I think the most important part of that is really understanding how you produce the results that you're looking for. A lot of people think that all of the jujitsu is crossover, and I, I don't agree with that. The fundamentals work everywhere, but a lot of stuff that's added into it, like strategies, it's not one size fits all for me. So really defining what you want and then understanding what it takes to get that for me is, is the way to go. So if people want to continue jujitsu down the path where it becomes like Taekwondo in America, 
where, you know, you've got a kid who's four years old with a black belt. Okay. That's, that's fine. That's not what I agree to. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously right now, the way IBJJF rules work, people can't get a black belt at that age. But if we keep going in this direction where it's really tournament focused, commercial focused, you know, maybe it's offset by the development of MMA and, and the guys that are actively fighting. And then there's this just major separation, like this is tournament style jujitsu and this is MMA, which, which is really the direction that I've seen it heading for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. So Todd, what's your definition of uh, jujitsu fundamentals, you know, because what's, what's, what's a fundamental in jujitsu? Uh, well, for me, fundamental in jiu-jitsu is to be able to establish an understanding and control and application of something. So I need to know where the problems can come from, right? So first mm-hmm. is learning. So when we learn jiu-jitsu, and, and this is in the places that I've trained, it doesn't mean everywhere, we typically start wherever they're at in the training program. Like the guy walks in and now they're doing some type of inverted guard. Like I don't even understand what the mount is. I don't know what cross side is. I don't know what half guard is. I don't know what you mean by back mount. I don't know. So the first thing is really understanding all of the positions and understanding the pros and cons of those positions. One thing I talk to guys about uh, on a regular basis because of my protective background is there are so many flaws inside of jujitsu. Jujitsu is my favorite martial art. I love it. I practice it every day. But you know, when you're on the ground fighting someone, it's very hard to see what's going on around you right? Your sight lines are killed. Also, normally when you fight, you want elevation over somebody. You don't want to be under them and you don't want to be equal to them on the ground. That's a problem. Another thing is when we talk about weapons, you have immediate access to weapons, meaning the bad guy can access my weapons and that's not what I want. Another component that's really important is surface space. Like I don't want to be hitting the ground when it's asphalt or when it's rocks. We don't train that way. And and, and I don't mean me, but most people, they're training on soft mats. So it's not realistic. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I'm fighting, another thing that we don't think about or talk about is the ability to disengage, to be mobile. And pretty much like if I've got a guy in my guard, I'm not mobile at all, right? Even if the guy's laying on me, I might try to sweep him to come to the top so I can get off. But that's a second or two or three away. And in a fight, in a real fight where someone's trying to kill you, Three seconds is an eternity. So for me, the fundamentals are understanding all of the positions and understanding the pros and cons of each of those positions. So for example, um, knee and belly, I think is great because knee and belly is a control position. You have elevation, you can access guns or knives or whatever you have. You can stop the guy from getting to his and you can just literally step off and you're mobile, you can stand up. And also when I'm up like that, I can see his friends running to come do things to me. I can see over the hoods of cars. Um, And also I can go right back into mount or I can go right back into a back take or I can go right into punching or I can go into choking. So, you know, understanding the pros of that position is really important because if I'm making a choice and I choose to like roll to guard in the street, that's problematic. And even if it's, if it's gi jujitsu, understanding the pros and cons of each position. So I need to know how do I want to be when I'm trying to get this takedown? What kind of takedown do I want to do? What am I exposing? What's my level of base or connection to the ground? What's my level of mobility from here? How do I do something and protect my jawline so I don't get knocked out and take out the the computer out of the fight, right? This is my software. This is my command center. How do I protect this while I'm doing the takedown? Can I connect to their body and control their body and have my jaws covered, my shoulder covering my other jaw? And in limiting the exposure, right, the chances of me winning goes up. So what takedowns offer that to me? When I get to the ground, where do I want to be? How do I want to get there? How do I solidify it? Um, you know, what what are the best side control positions for me? Okay, I can have two hands on this side, two hands on that side, one hand here or one hand here. How do I want to deploy that relative to my goals? And I have to first have basic fundamental understanding, not technique, understanding of what each position offers and what each position lacks, right? And even with upper belts now, I see they don't really get the strategies, right, in in some of these areas. So first thing is understanding the the mindset and the ideas and the pros and cons of each of the positions of jiu-jitsu. And then the second thing is to find out how I utilize my body type and my mindset to apply certain things well. And my goal is always to have 
at least two, if not three moves from every position so that I can go from A to B to C, and then I can go back to B or back to A. So it's A, B, C, C, A, C, A, B, C, A. And what happens is over time, that person cannot follow that sequence. They will make a mistake. They will make an error and you will capitalize and advance on it. So I need to be able to do that in every position. I need to be able to do that defensively. And that's another thing I don't see as much of today. I don't see a lot of working on defense because it's not as sexy. It's not as fun as attacking. Yeah. But really the first thing is being able to defend yourself requires an understanding first. And then a second part, which is you training that defense and not leaving your body in certain positions. And if you remember, Elio Gracie talked about that a lot. He's saying, you know, look, the first thing is defending yourself because if you can't submit me, maybe I didn't beat you, but you didn't beat me. And I yeah. really agree with that mindset. You <laughs> so survive the fight, survival, mm -hmm. right? So fundamentals would be the most core techniques that you can apply from basic positions under stress, right? And you can maintain the good technique, the good angles, and you can adapt between those fundamental techniques and principles under stress across time with different levels of opponents. That for me is, is the core of jujitsu. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. That's super cool. That gold. That's gold. So Todd, there are any question I didn't ask you and um, I, you know, I should ask you during this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, if, if people are starting out in jujitsu, I, I think the, the key thing to understand is you can start as the worst person in the world in jujitsu. There, you, you can have no skills, physically, mentally, whatever it may be. And maybe even jujitsu makes no sense to you. I've worked with people that took years before it sunk in. And you can't compare yourself to other people. You have to go in and look at it from the perspective of you and where you're at and where you're starting. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, anybody listening that's doing jujitsu, starting out and saying, man, this is hard, this sucks. Jiu-Jitsu is one of the few things in life that will pay dividends over and over and over again. You know, some things in life, even with like human relationships, I can put a lot into a relationship with that person, but it's all my energy going out and they give very little back to me. Jiu-Jitsu is never that way. No matter what you put in Jiu-Jitsu, you always get that and something more out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about that in terms of physical fitness and confidence and self-defense and camaraderie with the people you train jujitsu with. And that's all good stuff. But the trick is, the key is very, very simple, very simple. The only way to not get good at jujitsu is to quit. And so jujitsu has one simple solution, no magic pill. You just keep coming. You just, as much as you can come, just keep coming. So anybody listening is having a hard time in jujitsu right now. The solution is to say, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard a lot. I'm a black belt with a lot of experience in MMA and, and gi jiu-jitsu and nogi and, and fighting on the street and fighting with weapons. I've got all this history, but I still have very hard periods, right? Where I have an injury and I'm trying to work new techniques or new approaches or where, you know, there's a, a, a problem in life with, uh, you know, family or with your work or something like that. And you're mentally fatigued. And so when you come to the gym, you're like, I don't want to go. And you need to force yourself to go because that is the solution to all your problems, right? That's going to handle everything for you and you will get better and you will become a black belt if you don't quit and you will become better than everybody in the room at some point. You will become the best guy in the room. You just have to keep coming. So that I would say is something worth talking about. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is you, we talked briefly about this, but the book Protection Forum from Humanity is available on Amazon and all the different platforms that you can go to, or you can go to my site, tourprotection.com mm -hmm. and get it. Um, but also, you know, if there are people that are in, particular in New Zealand, they're interested in training to keep in touch with you, to keep in touch with Steve Oliver, because I'm coming back to New Zealand and we will do some training. And the training that we offer is very different from everybody else's training. I promise you that it is not like anything else that's in New Zealand. And we, we train from the lowest level to the highest level in principles and mindsets and systems. We do a classroom training, which is about four hours. And then we do four hours practical application field exercises. Mm -hmm. And we do two, three and five day classes for the civilian market. So, you know, I'd love to come down there and, and meet some more Kiwis, hang out with you guys, train some jujitsu, but more importantly, teach guys some of the protective skills that I employ anywhere in the world that I go. 
that's so awesome. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I can't wait for sure. So Todd, it has Me been too, a buddy. has been a pleasure, my brother. Thank you so much for your time and you know, to make the time to have this conversation. I mean, lots of goals in this this conversation. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's gonna add so much value to to our community. Yeah, so thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I, yeah, I'm looking forward to meet you in person and to have you here at Combat Room in Wellington so we can do some training and, you know, came to learn from you as well, for sure. A hundred percent, man. I'm looking forward to it. I, I love it there. And, and uh, it'd be my honor to come training with you. Thank you for your time today. Ah, thank you, Todd. So yeah, if you guys, again, if you guys want to know more about Todd Fox uh, work, so please check it out, Protection for and from Humanity and uh, Tour Protection as well. So follow on Instagram. I'm going to post all the links here, but yeah. So Todd, all the very best, my brother. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you.